Hey everybody, welcome to our adult discipleship class on the Old Testament history books. Now, this is actually part two of our Old Testament overview. Pastor Matthew Morvey taught a class recently on the first five books of the Bible. It's called the Pentateuch. So I would encourage you, if you didn't see that, or if you're unfamiliar with the fir first five books of the Bible, go back and watch those videos, read through those books with Pastor Morvey, and it'll help you understand what's going on in the history books. A lot of what goes on in the history books depends on on at least a broad understanding of those first five books of the Old Testament. But here in this one, we're going to cover the books of Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings. There are other history books in the Old Testament, and we hope to do those in another class. But for now, those are the ones that we're focusing on. And in those books, we're going to cover some of the most uh, familiar passages and stories in all of the Bible. We're going to talk about the walls of Jericho falling down. We're going to talk about David and Goliath, the wisdom of Solomon. All these things are really, really familiar stories to us, but we're also going to cover some of the more neglected parts of the Bible and some of the parts that are really hard to uh, apply to our lives. The hope for this is for us to see how these passages help us understand the rest of the Bible more fully and how these passages are actually useful to make us more like Christ. So like 2 Timothy 3, 16 tells us, all scripture is breathed out by God, even the genealogies and some of this stuff, all of it's breathed out by God and it's profitable for teaching and for reproof and correction and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That's talking about this stuff. Whenever Paul says it's all useful for this and that it, all of it will help you be equipped for every good work, that's what this is. So we want to help you understand how to read it and apply it in that way. So I would encourage you as you watch through these videos over the next six weeks to take time to read the books. Uh, the people who know the Bible deeply aren't the people who watch classes on the Bible. The people who know the Bible deeply are the people who read the Bible. And it may seem like a daunting task to read through all of this in just a matter of six weeks, but it's, you can do it a lot quicker than you actually think. So different people put the time, the, the length differently, but by my calculation, uh, an average reader can read through all of this in a matter of 12 hours. In 12 hours, you can read Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings. And even 12 hours might sound a lot, but if, if you do it 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes at night, you can read through it in less than a month. That's pretty quick. So let's say you're a really slow reader. Chop that in half. Or it, you just want to read it 15 minutes in the morning. You can do it in less than two months. So you, you can get through reading all of this, what we're covering Pretty, pretty easily. So I would encourage you to do that. Um, I don't know about you, but I want to understand the Bible deeply, and I want it to be flowing through, uh, flowing through my heart and my mind constantly, and the only way for that to happen is for us to read the Bible. So I would also encourage you, uh, if you're not reading through the entire Bible, if, if, if you have just picked different spots and you don't know where to start, you can start here, but I would also encourage you to jump in on our one-year Bible reading plan with the whole church that we're reading through the Bible in a year. You can find that on your app. Also on your app, you can find resources for this class, some uh, important resources that give you outlines and study group questions if you want to go through this with a group as well. So let's just ask a question really quick, though. Why, why should we study the Old Testament? What is the point of studying the Old Testament? Isn't it just like this old, dilapidated, uh, the old stuff that doesn't matter so much because we have the New Testament and the New Testament tells us about Jesus. Well, first of all, we study the Old Testament because it teaches us about God. The same God of the New Testament is the God of the Old Testament. Some people think the Old Testament God's just this wrathful, angry God, and then the New Testament God is the one of grace and love, but that's not that's not true. It's the same God in both places. You see the love and the grace of God in an amazing way in the Old Testament. And then you see the wrath and the justice of God happening in the New Testament as well. So reading the Old Testament teaches us about God. It teaches us specifically about Christ. So in the New Testament, over and over, you have the apostles and, and Jesus himself pointing us back to the Old Testament to teach us about Jesus. The Bible's one big story, and the whole point of it is pointing us to the work of Jesus. And it, it actually prepares us to understand the New Testament correctly. So 
It gives us historical and thematic context. So we're going to talk about this uh, repeatedly in this class, uh, this narrative arc of the Bible. But what the Old Testament does is it sets you up for the New Testament here. So when we talk about the narrative arc of the Bible, if you look at this, this is a general, it, it, it's a, an arc of the Bible and it's an arc really of the gospel as well. We know at the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth. So we know that God is the perfect creator, that all things flow from him. Everything that is good flows from him. He is the authority over all things. What he says goes and he created all things good. But then we know that in Genesis three, the fall happened. Human beings fell. They disobeyed God and they were separated from God. They brought a curse onto the world and onto themselves so that Adam and Eve, these first humans, uh, be became heads of all creation to where now everyone descended from them has sin in our hearts and we are separated from God. That leads to this period of longing or of anticipation that there's, there's something going on that uh, that maybe we can find our way back to not no longer being separated from God, but right now we just live in this time of curse and this time of struggle and this time of being far from God. And then you come to the New Testament and you have the story of redemption where uh, God becomes a man. Jesus Christ lives a perfect life. He dies on the cross paying for our sins. He rises from the grave defeating death. He ascends to heaven. And he, he rules in heaven there, and he has sent his Holy Spirit to those who put their faith in him so that they can have life as well, so that they can no longer be separated from God. So this is the story of Jesus, and then uh, this, we're somewhere in here after the story of Jesus, and we anticipate a day when Jesus will return and he will recreate. It goes back here to creation, that he will recreate and make all things new again. So this is the overall big picture general story arc of the Bible. We see this throughout, but it's really emphasized in Revelation at the end of the Bible. So that's the big narrative arc. So all of this, though, is Old Testament that is pointing us and helping us understand what's happening here in the New Testament time. So it's important for us to just not throw it out. Otherwise, we just have half of the ark, and that's not helpful to us. So um, we also see in the Old Testament little miniature redemptive arcs like this that, that are giving us just glimpses of the whole. So uh, here in the Old Testament, you'll see a little arc that, that kind of gives you a glimpse of what is happening in the big picture. Uh, we also see just allusions and quotations, especially if you look like in the book of Matthew. In the book of Matthew, it's, uh, it, it is constantly pointing us to the Old Testament, to Old Testament stories and sayings and the law. And you wouldn't understand the book of Matthew as nearly as well if you haven't read the Old Testament before. And in the, ultimately, the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ. So there's so many things that happen in the Old Testament that point us to Christ and he is the fulfillment of it. So it teaches us about God, it teaches us about Christ, and it we read the Old Testament to be transformed. This is our ultimate goal when, whenever we're reading the Bible at all. We want to learn about God, we want to learn about Jesus, we want to learn about who we are, but in the end, we want it to change us. So if you read in the book of James, we want to be doers of the word, not hearers only. We don't want to just read it and get information. We want it to actually change our life. All scripture is profitable for training in righteousness. So the whole Bible displays the glory of God. And we're going to see how the Old Testament displays God's glory in salvation through judgment that God's way of bringing salvation is through judgment. And it points us and it prepares us in the New Testament to see God's glory and redemption and how he saves us through judgment in the coming of Christ. So uh, I gave just a little bit of an overview with this narrative arc um, of, of the big picture of the story, but just a quick overview of what's in the Old Testament. We have the first five books of the of the Bible is the Pentateuch that you can go and learn about with uh, uh, Matthew Morvey's uh, uh, discipleship class. 
We have the history books. Again, there's a few more that we're not going to cover in this, but we'll cover about half of those. Then there's the writings and the wisdom literature. That's like Psalms, Proverbs. Those, the, there's a lot of songs there and just wise sayings. And then there's the prophets. There's major prophets and minor prophets. And uh, those major prophets and minor prophets usually fell in the storyline of the history books of the Old Testament and their, uh, the collected sayings of those prophets. So here we come to uh, the book of Joshua. So we're going to start this, this first class with Joshua, but it's important for us to pause just for a couple more minutes and say, what led up to Joshua? Joshua follows the story of the people of Israel. So who in the world are the people of Israel? You might be really familiar with their story, but it goes all the way back again to this story of creation. God creates man and woman, Adam and Eve, and they fall. And what happens there in Genesis chapter 3, they're, they're cursed as I, as, as I referenced before. Uh, but then God, not only with the curse, uh, he, he not only curses them, but he also gives a promise that is to come. So he says to the woman, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. So this is a curse. Uh, but then uh, if, if you go back up to where God is talking to the serpent, to the one who tempted them, to, the, to our enemy, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So here at the very, very beginning, way up here in, in the fall, we're seeing just a glimpse of what is going to happen here, that there's going to be an offspring, a descendant, or the Bible will call it a seed, someone coming from the woman, some human who is going to come along and is going to crush the head of the serpent, that, that, that is going to give hope for humankind. So then as you follow the story of the Old Testament, uh, it it gets things get worse and worse people sin more and more and then we're introduced to this guy named abraham and god comes to abraham abraham is a nobody he's he's a pagan uh, but god saves him and he tells him that through him all the families of the world are going to be blessed and so this is like the carrying of that offspring so now we, now we know that through Abraham, all the world is going to be blessed. So that offspring is going to come through Abraham. Abraham has a son, Isaac. Isaac has a son, Jacob. Jacob is renamed Israel. And so the promise of God is going to come through Israel. And then we know that long sequence of events where uh, his sons are terrible brothers and uh, some crazy stuff happens. They end up going to Egypt. They become slaves in Egypt. They live in Egypt for 400 years in slavery. And then with Moses, they're delivered out of Egypt, and God says, I'm going to take you back to this promised land. So whenever God uh, showed himself to Abraham, he told him, I'm going to give you this land, this land of Canaan. And so now God is bringing them up out of Egypt, and he's saying, I'm going to take you to that land. But they're disobedient. They don't obey God. Ultimately, they get to the land. They send in spies to the land, and they're like, nope, there's giants. They've got big cities. It's scary. It's terrifying. We're not doing this. And God says, okay, you're going to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years, and all of the adults in you are going to die off, and your kids are going to get to go into the promised land. And that's, so that's what happens, and that's where we pick up here in Joshua. Joshua was actually one of the spies who went in, but he came back and said, oh yeah, we got this because God's on our side. He's one of the only remaining surviving people from that time. So they all die off in the wilderness and now it's their children and God is saying, okay, my promise is going to happen. We are going to go into this land. So the main theme of the book of Joshua is trusting a faithful savior to lead God's people to land and rest. Trusting a faithful savior to lead God's people to land and rest. So if we do just a, a big overview, uh, we can see that uh, it's kind of divided up into four sections and all of it uh, points to them trusting God. So this, I don't know how well you can see that on the video, but this is sort of a map of, uh, of the land. And uh, chapters one through five, are them trusting God as they enter into the promised land. So they come in on this side, on this side of the Jordan. In chapters 1 through 5, it talks about them crossing the Jordan and God preparing them to go and take the land. 
Uh, chapters 6 through 13 are the story of them taking the land. They go uh, to different spots and they have different battles and um, ups and downs, obedience, disobedience, all sorts of stuff happens. They take eventually take the land. Uh, chapters 14 through 21 are them dividing the promised land. So those are kind of the hardest for you to read because it's talking about all the geographic boundaries and that sort of thing. But it's, a, it's actually a really important, important part of the Bible because it lays the foundation for the rest of the stories where we're talking about these different tribes living, living in different places. That's the background of all that. So it's a little hard to read, but it is important. And then uh, the, at the end, chapters 22 through 24 are them accomplishing the promised rest that God has promised to give them this land, and in this land they would have rest, and he delivers on his promise. They have at least some semblance of rest. So that's a general overview of what happens uh, in the Bible. We can divide this theme of trusting a faithful Savior to lead God's people to land and rest into four sort of key themes. And so I want to walk through these key themes, and while we walk through these, we'll sort of walk through some of the important parts of the text. So first of all, is trusting as God's people, trusting as God's people. So it's important for us to realize that the people of God are the people of God because God has chosen them. It's not a transactional relationship where they do something for God and God's like, oh, great, I'm thankful for that. So I'm going to do something for you and now you're going to do something for me. It's, It's not this back and forth like that. They are trusting God because They are ontologically, because of what God has done and how he has chosen them, they are God's people. And uh, in the Old Testament, it's a little different than the New Testament, actually a lot different than the New Testament. For you to be part of the people of God, you must be part of the people of Israel. So there were times like uh, Rahab in Jericho, there were times that Gentiles were brought in to be part of the people of Israel. But... In general, the people of God in the Old Testament are the people of Israel from Jacob on. So um, th- that's what leads us here to uh, chapter 1. If you look with me in Josh, if you haven't turned already, go to Joshua chapter 1. And we're going to look starting in uh, verse 5 of chapter 1 and just read a couple verses of this. This is God talking to Joshua. It says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. What a promise. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. So God is... And God is promising to, to, he's calling this particular people, Israel, to go in and to take this land. And it's going to be through God that they take the land. This is, they can trust in him because they are the people of God and he is delivering the land into their hands. So if you go on uh, to Joshua chapter 5, I'm not going to read from it, but uh, all the way back with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, God gave a symbol of his people that all the people of all his people, the descendants of Abraham, the descendants in the end of Israel, would be circumcised. And this was a sign that it was a distinction between them and the other nations. So for them, as God's people, it was a symbol of circumcision. Well, they hadn't done this in the wilderness. And so in chapter 5, you see a new generation is circumcised. And so it's, again, God is setting apart these people as the people of God. And then if you go over to uh, Joshua chapter 8, There's this covenant renewal. So if you look at verses 34 and 35, it says, Afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel and the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among them. So 
Joshua is going back to, the, uh, to, to those first five books of the Old Testament. He's going back and reading the writings of Moses and the things that God said. This is what it means to be my people, and this is what I expect from you. And he's reading those things and renewing this covenant that God has declared the people of Israel are my people, and I am going to deliver this land into them. Now, this is a really important theme for us as we turn to the New Testament because, it, it, as I mentioned before, it's a little different now in the, old, in, in the New Testament. Testament. Uh, how do we become part of the people of Christ now, uh, uh, the people of God now? It's through faith in Christ, right? It's, it's through the work of Jesus. It doesn't matter if we're a Jew or a Gentile. It doesn't matter our background or uh, who we are, which is just an extraordinary blessing of the new covenant. But if, if you look in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verses 9 and 10, this is God... Uh, God speaking through Peter, he says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Listen to this. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So before, we weren't part of the people of God. We weren't, unless you're by heritage a Jew, you weren't part of the people of God, but now God has made us his people by, through, through Christ, through faith in Christ. So much like the people of Israel had to trust in God as he took them into a promised land, we must put our faith in God. And it's not based on a transactional relationship where I give God something and he gives me salvation. But instead, my hope is in God and my trust is in God solely because he has declared over me that I am his people, that I am a child of God. It's solely based on the work of God uh, in, in my life and his gracious work on my behalf. It's not because of something I've done for him. So they're, they're trusting as God's people. They are trusting in God's faithful Savior. So Joshua is the Savior that God raises up to deliver his people Israel into this promised land. And uh, the point of this character of Joshua is to point us to the ultimate Savior. So the name of Joshua means God is salvation. And that's actually should be a familiar name. Joshua is actually a, another form of the name Jesus. So already in the name, we ought to be like, okay, there's Joshua, Jesus. Like th there's some sort of connection here. But Joshua is, is the figure of a Savior that is delivering the people of God. And so in the New Testament, whenever Jesus is named Jesus, you'll notice uh, if you look in Matthew chapter 1, they say, you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. In a very similar way, now Joshua in the Old Testament here is, is, is called God is, God is salvation because he is the one that is delivering the people of Israel and saving them from their enemies and put, sending them into the promised land. So uh, the, the people's hope rests, first of all, obviously on God, but it really does rest a lot on Joshua. If you go back to what we read in chapter 1 uh, just a few minutes ago, God tells Moses, do not turn from what I have told you to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. So he's, he, he is putting a lot of weight on Joshua here as the Savior, that like if Joshua follows the Lord, then the people follow behind Joshua. If Joshua goes astray, the people end up going astray. And the people do trust in Joshua. If you look down uh, at verses 16 and 17, the people say, we're going to follow you like we followed Moses, which by the way, they didn't always follow Moses and they're not always going to follow Joshua. But but we know that they end up failing. They, they end up either not following Joshua or Joshua ends up failing himself because Joshua is not the ultimate savior. And we see this over and over in the Old Testament. We see leader after leader coming in and leading imperfectly. And what it does is it creates, as we look at that narrative arc of the Bible, it creates an anticipation for something. It creates a longing for something where we see all these human leaders and leaders in the Old Testament, they're like, oh, this Joshua is the savior. Joshua is the one that's going to lead the people of Israel into the promised land. Joshua is the one that's going to save his people. But then Joshua dies, you know, and he's ultimately none of these leaders in the Old Testament are perfect leaders. And it creates an anticipation that there must be someone better. 
There must be someone, remember, that, that God has promised that a seed of the woman, a descendant of the woman, is going to crush the head of the serpent, is going to deliver the people of God. But it seems like every descendant of a woman that shows up is messed up and is never enough. But we do see that Joshua points us forward to the Savior that we can trust. Because whenever Jesus comes, we know uh, that Jesus is, actually succeeds. And in Jesus, we can find our place among God's people in God's promised land. So there's a lot of repeated imagery here too in, in the Old Testament. So if you think back to the first five books of the Old Testament, you think back to the book of Exodus and, and talking about Moses. Moses, he, he brings the people up out of Egypt and then they go through the Red Sea, right? God, God parts the Red Sea and they go through the Red Sea. And then they go to this mountain and uh, Moses goes up the mountain, God gives him the law, and he uh, brings the law to the people. Well, what happens here at the beginning of Joshua is a very similar thing. What happens here at the beginning of Joshua is a repeated, that they're coming out of the wilderness, similar to coming out of Egypt. They end up crossing the Jordan, and what does God do? He parts the waters. So he's already like pointing Joshua back to Moses. He's like, okay, this is the same sort of thing. He's going to save my people. They go through the water, and then if you look a few chapters in where uh, what I said about the covenant being renewed, that he, go, he goes up on a mountain and he delivers the law. So it, it points us back to Moses. It also points us forward to something, though. We see repeated imagery in the New Testament, especially in the book of Matthew. You see Jesus, because he runs from Herod, he goes down to Egypt to be, be saved from, from Herod when he's a child. And then he, he comes up from Egypt, and one of the first things we see about Jesus is he is baptized where? In the Jordan River, the Jordan that, jo that Joshua crossed. He, he goes into the Jordan. He goes through the waters. And then uh, what happens after that? He, he goes into the wilderness, which is significant for other reasons, but then he ends up going up on a hill or on a mountain and delivering the Sermon on the Mount in which he sort of, he, he fulfills the law. He says, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And then he goes on to say things about the law, like you've heard it said, do not murder. But I say, if you have anger in your heart against your brother, then you're guilty of murder. So he, he starts to give the law. So there's repeated Im imagery that repeats all over, not only at the Old Testament, but then it comes back and shows up again in the New Testament, especially in the life of Jesus. So Trusting as God's people, trusting in God's faithful Savior, which really points us to Christ. Trusting God for land. So on the surface, this is about a little strip of land in, um, in the Middle East. That, that's what it seems like on the, uh, on the front of this. So uh, again, I don't know how well you can see that on the videos, but this is a general picture of the land that they're going in to possess that God has promised them. So if you go back to Numbers chapter 34, it gives kind of the boundaries of, of the land that God has promised to them. So over here, uh, this shows the extent of what the promised land is supposed to be as, as shown in Numbers 34. And uh, they, some of these tribes end up not going across the river, so they're um, hanging out over there. But that's what that is. And then here, this is the division of the tribes that you see in Joshua um, and at least as far as we can tell based on the geography it gives, this is how they divided up the, the tribes. So these are all based on the sons of, of Jacob, and each tribe got its spot. You see a big tribe down here is Judah. Judah is the one in Genesis that, uh, that Jacob blesses the most, and it, it appears that it's going to be through Judah that this descendant, this seed, this promised one who's supposed to deliver the people is supposed to come from Judah. And uh, in the end, you do see Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. Of Judah. So there's that. That's, that's Judah. That's the division of the land. This is the, the physical land that God promised, but it's much deeper than this. It's much deeper than just the idea of, oh, we got this little uh, plot of land in the Middle East, it goes a lot deeper than that. The promised land points us in the Bible both backwards and forwards, as a lot of things do. It points us backwards to uh, something that came at the very, very beginning that we've already referenced. When God created the earth, he put man and, man and woman where? 
in the Garden of Eden. And what was the Garden of Eden? The Garden of Eden was a, a, a garden. Uh, I mean, it was, it was flourishing, right? It was paradise. It was supposed to be uh, this beautiful, wonder pl- wonderful place. Well, what happens? Adam and Eve sin. They get kicked out of the garden, okay? And then if, if you have read it recently, you probably remember something that happens. They get kicked out of the garden, and then on the, as they get kicked out of the garden, God places an angel with a sword at the east end of the garden to guard the tree of life so that they can't come back into the garden and eat from the tree of life and be sinful forever. Uh, And and so uh, God places this angel with a sword to guard this paradise land. Well, um, so it's pointing us back to that. But now Israel comes to the promised land. And where do they come from? They're coming from this side, right? What's this side? This is the east. They're coming from the east. What side of Eden was the flaming sword or the sword angel person? On the east. Turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. Uh, if you look at verse 13, when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted his eyes and look, looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua said to him, went to him and said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So, now he comes in from the east and what does he meet? He meets an angel with a sword. Now, I'm not saying like this is actually Eden, but at least symbolically, it is pointing us backwards to Eden and saying, okay, this is supposed to be paradise. This is supposed to be uh, them getting back to Eden. But what happens? Canaan doesn't look much like Eden. Like it's, I, I mean, it's got flowing with milk and honey and all that stuff. It's, it's great. But the, the only thing that ends up really being similar is that the people of God sin and get kicked out of it, just like Adam and Eve sinned and got kicked out of the garden. That ultimately the people of God are unfaithful enough that he removes them from from Israel. So in in the end, it doesn't fulfill. It does it doesn't uh, it doesn't satisfy the the need to get back to Canaan. So then for the rest of the Bible it's almost this feeling of trying to get back to Eden, try, trying to get back to this place of paradise. But the promised land also points us forward because it create, creates this anticipation, remember. So it points us forward to the new heaven and the new earth. If you, uh, g- if you flip over to, um, to in the New Testament in Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride uh, for her, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. So again, this brings us back to trusting as God's people that in the end, God is going to to be that we are going to be his people. He is going to be our God. And what happens? He dwells with them. Does that sound familiar? How about the Garden of Eden? When God walked with Adam and Eve before they were separated from God, God is dwelling with them. And if you go over to Revelation 22, um, it says, The angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit. This looks a lot like Eden. Eden is described as this place where there, there's a river and there's a tree. So Revelation is pointing us back to Eden and the promised land here is supposed to be pointing us forward to Revelation to the time when we will dwell with God and when the people of God will be given this heavenly possession. So, um, it points us to ultimate fulfillment whenever Jesus delivers his people to a new Eden, and it gives us hope for heaven. So there is a tough question about, uh, about 
these history books, and particularly in Joshua, you'll see it again in 2 Samuel. But a tough question about all of this is God is sending his people in, and he's giving these commands like, kill everyone, destroy everything. Don't leave man, woman, child, destroy all of it. And it's a really, really challenging question. Like, what, what do we do with that? How do we read that? Like, yeah, God's promising them this land, but other people live there. So what in the world do we do with that? I, I don't really have time here to address it in a really, really good extensive way. But I would say, again, we have to read the Bible in light of all of the rest of the Bible. And what we read in Genesis 3 is the fall of mankind. And because sin has come into the world and all have sinned, we all deserve death and we all deserve the judgment of God. So first we have to put humankind in our place and put God in his place and recognize that when we read these stories and we ask how can a good God order someone order the death of all these people it's kind of the wrong question the question really is how did the israelites get to survive too like in the end it's how does how does god not put the judgment of death on everyone and it points us back to actually the grace of god so so yet these these people israel becomes the instrument of god's judgment bringing the death of all these people uh, because all of them are separated from God and all of us are deserving death. That actually points us to say, like, we're Canaan. When we look in this story, we're not necessarily Israel at this, at this point. We're Canaan. We're the people who deserve to die, to be, to, who deserve to be judged. And yet God showed us enough grace to not do it. God showed us enough grace to let us live. So, I think we should focus on the grace of God in allowing us to live whenever he has held back his judgment. God doesn't owe us life. Even the air that we breathe in our lungs is a grace from God. So it's not necessarily ultimately a satisfying answer, and there's a lot more things that we can say about that. It is a difficult question that we have to wrestle with. But in the end, we look at this and we can recognize the grace of God in allowing us not all to be wiped away in judgment. So uh, finally, really quick, we are um, talking about, uh, let's go back here. We're talking about trusting as God's people, trusting in God's faithful Savior, trusting God for land, and finally, trusting God for rest. So if you look all the way, uh, they, they've gone through the land of Canaan. They've defeated uh, the, the people of Canaan all over the place. They haven't quite defeated everyone, and we'll talk about that. But if you go to Joshua chapter 21, uh, Joshua chapter 21, verses 43 to 44. It says, Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers. And they took possession of it, and they settled there, and the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. So, again, remember, this is what God is doing. So when they enter into the, they, they go across the Jordan, and then the first place that they show up is Jericho. What do they do to defeat Jericho? They walk around the city seven times and the walls fall down and they defeat it. Like, that's, that's not Israel doing anything. That's God delivering Jericho over to them. And this, this is what happens everywhere they go. Everything that they do, it's not the people of Israel getting this victory. It is God on their behalf uh, winning the victory for them. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hand. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. So we get some semblance of rest here. But here's the problem. Israel wasn't perfect. Israel wasn't the fulfillment. And this isn't the final rest. This is not the final fulfillment. So Israel is unfaithful in, in a lot of ways. They go through and they're, they're obeying God in a lot of, at a lot of times, defeating people, driving people out of the land. But a lot of the time they don't. They say, oh, so-and-so is living over there. You know, they're not really bothering us. We think we'll, we'll leave them alone. And those people end up turning on them and actually being a problem for them and actually uh, leading these people away from God at times. And that's going to be a problem. We know that in the end, 
the people of Israel walk away from the Lord and they end up getting kicked out, not, not in the book of Joshua, but we're going to see before the end of the class, they end up getting kicked out of the land of Israel. They lose their possession. They don't have rest. They have war on every side because they, didn't, they weren't faithful. They didn't drive these people out as they were commanded to do. So jud- Judges, the next book that we're going to talk about, is basically the opposite of rest. It basically points us like saying everything has fallen apart. So this rest has to be pointing to something greater. If God promised rest and this isn't it, it has to be pointing us to something greater. So we'll wrap up by looking over if you turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. In Hebrews chapter 4, he's talking about uh, them entering into the land. If you look at verse 8, it says, if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did. So uh, the writer of Hebrews is saying, look, the, the rest that Joshua provided wasn't the final rest. It was pointing to something. And what does Jesus say over in uh, the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 11? Jesus tells us, I am come to me and I will give you rest for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Come to me, you will find rest for your souls. Ultimately, this is all pointing us to Christ, that in the end, The only place, the only true source of rest, the only true source of peace is Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment. So as we read the book of Joshua, we need to follow these themes of how God is trustworthy, how how they can put their hope in in Christ and he's he's in, in God and he's powerful. And we can consider in our own life how we need to put our hope and our trust in God and what it means that through a faithful savior, God is leading his people to land and rest. God is leading his people ultimately to a place where he will dwell with them and they will have rest on every side. Y'all, this should make us worship. This should make us repent of our sins and put our hope in Christ alone. Uh, It's amazing to see how the Old Testament is pointing us to these realities. So I went a little longer today than I hope to for the rest of them. So please uh, uh, don't be scared by the 40 minutes this time. I'm hoping it's 30 minutes next time we had some intro on this one. Um, But uh, read I would encourage you for this week, read the Bible, read uh, Joshua, and if you can, get through Judges too, because next week we're going to be talking about uh, about Judges, and as you read, look at it and say, how is this teaching me about God? How is it pointing me to Jesus? And how is this wanting to transform my life? So try and read Joshua and Judges this week, and I will see you next week.